So uh, a couple days ago, I got back from uh, this week-long seminar in New York at the Henry George School of Social Sciences. Uh, it was being taught by an economist named Mason Gaffney, who uh, his name probably doesn't mean much to most of you, but he's uh, probably the most important Georgist economist since Henry George himself. And so it was really an honor to study under him, and I, I definitely learned a lot. Um, in light of my recent debate with uh, Joe Ponchivani, the uh, Coffee with Joe guy, uh, I thought I'd actually talk a little bit about land uh, as it relates to banking and money. Um, because that's the thing that Gaffney talks about, uh, particularly in, his, in the, this uh, book that I highly recommend, which is called After the Crash, Design a, a Depression-Free Economy. So, you know, there's this common misnomer out there that says that uh, banks create money out of nothing. Now, that seems to be true if you just look at the reserves side of it, which the whole monetary reform movement is doing, uh, and ignored the capital side, which is where the real action is. Because, see, banks are never reserve constrained, but they are capital constrained. They can be over leveraged on capital, but not really on reserves. So, um, what banks actually do is not so much, uh, you know, create, create money out of nothing or create out of debt. What they're do doing is converting assets into liquidity. They're taking collateral of these for these loans. They, have, you know, they have to put them on their asset uh, balance sheet and lend on that. Now, one of the most common uh, assets used as collateral is land. Um, you know, and the more land you have, the the lower interest rate you can get on a loan, and you know, so that leads to higher and higher concentration of land. Uh, and um, you know, one real problem with land as collateral is that it's not a um, productive asset. It's basically just a transfer of wealth. You know, you it, there, there's just a fixed supply of land, and people are selling it to each other. And you know, so using that as, as your collateral is just bidding up the the value of land. Uh, what this does uh, is basically is it ends up creating an opportunity cost for new investment. Um, so, you know, it, which ends up lowering the rate of return for entrepreneurs. And so this uh, this whole absorption of liquidity plus the diminishing returns on new investments leads to what Keynes called a liquidity trap. Except that, uh, see, Keynes thought the liquidity trap was just was a psychological phenomenon where people, you know, hoard money and are, and are afraid to spend it. But in fact, what we find is that the liquidity trap is based on real constraints. It's not just psychological. And in light of this, I would like to note briefly here uh, something about infrastructure. And see, that's another thing that the whole monetary reform movement is big on. You know, Zerlinga says that you know, in the in the monetary reform act that new uh, money should be spent on infrastructure that will create wealth and then circulate throughout, throughout the economy. He doesn't understand the uh, nature of fixed versus circulating capital. See, what you do with infrastructure is um, you end up tying up liquidity into fixed assets which have a uh, uh, which have a very slow turnover rate. And the thing about you know, the thing about keeping an economy going is having a high amount of circulating capital. You know, Turgot talked about uh, how uh, an economy is supported by a circulating fund of capital. When you build lots of fixed assets, you know, roads, highways, all that stuff. I mean, sure, that stuff is necessary to a certain extent, but uh, you end up tying up the liquidity of the economy into assets that don't turn over a lot. And so you have to keep building more and more of that in order to uh, keep up uh, you know, employment. And in the meantime, you're bidding up land values uh, and creating that, that very liquidity trap. So, uh, so that's why this whole, the whole fixation on infrastructure that these monetary reformers have will end up uh, creating another crash if implemented. So, uh, you know, infrastructure is important. Uh, it should be financed primarily at a local level out of land taxes. Um, you know, and the idea of having some huge national project for that. 
you know, is misguided in a lot of ways. It, what you really need to do is is help um, foster this uh, the flow of circulating capital. And so what that brings you to is uh, this thing called the real bills doctrine, which goes back to Adam Smith, uh, which basically it says that collateral should be based not on fixed assets like land, but on um, circulating or self-liquidating assets. So, you know, you take you know, like the raw materials that you're going to use to produce your product. You're going to end up, you know, you, you buy those materials, uh, you, you know, apply production to it, and then you end up selling it. That's liquidating that, that asset. So it uh, turns lending towards short-term loans uh, that help entrepreneurs with their projects and uh, helps keep the uh, circulating fund of capital that Turgo talked about. Uh, and in doing so, it will be non-inflationary because you're not bidding up uh, the uh, price of assets. And so, uh, with that said, I want to talk a little bit about the concentration of ownership uh, you know, with of corporations as well as banks. You know, Joe said for uh, but didn't seem to explain why uh, his whole monitor reform would. Uh, would end up producing more, um, more small banks, more, um, uh, you know, what's the, what, you know, um, more credit unions and things like that. But um, I, I don't see how it, it would. What you, what you would do, however, by uh, taxing land values and and having a real bills doctrine, is. Uh, with banks unable to lend on on land, they would have to lend on short-term loans, which would create more competition among banks. Because uh, a lot of people don't realize that most banks actually have small uh, profit margins. It's only like some of the top Wall Street banks that really have these really you know gigantic profit margins, and you know that has that has nothing to do with their ability to create money out of nothing. It it has to do with uh, the assets that they that they hold, which are you know, mostly uh, land and fixed capital. Um, so, you know, it would, and uh, meanwhile, you know, the corporations, you know, firms are also uh, affected by this, uh, by uh, uh, land values because uh, larger corporations tend to be uh, more land intensive and less labor intensive. Uh, in fact, I think uh, Thorsten Veblen uh, talked about how large firms tend to be stores of value first and, um, and engines of productivity only second. So you know what you so what you do by taxing land values is actually create more local economies, uh, smaller scale um, businesses and smaller scale banks that uh, create sustainable loans and don't end up uh, using a, a boom bust cycle. So. Uh, having a real bills doctrine uh, and uh, taxing the full rental value of land would help so solve the whole uh, too big to fail problem. And so that's why I think the whole attempt to uh, to try and attack banks on the reserve side is just utterly mistaken. You know, I I would support the idea of of the treasury. You know, issuing dollars instead of treasury bonds, but you know that's that's just kind of icing on the cake. What what I really need to look at is land. So uh, anyway, I guess uh, I'll leave it there for now. Peace.